The year is 1902. It's a year before the Wright brothers will make their historic flight at Kitty Hawk and Henry Ford will introduce the Model T. Teddy Roosevelt is in the White House and Scott Joplin is delighting the public with his newest ragtime composition, The Entertainer. On March 2nd, near the Meskwaki Indian Reservation at Dysart, Iowa, Charles and Josephine Gothrop welcome their sixth child, a girl named Grace. Like many farm families of the time, large families are the rule, and Josephine will eventually have seven more children. The Gothrops are ordinary folk and just manage to get by, living off the land. When Charles hears talk of more fertile soil to the south, he packs up his family and moves to Missouri. Conditions are not much better there, and soon the Gothrops move again to Monmouth. Monmouth College today can rejoice in Charles Gothrop's decision to come to Monmouth, for he brought with him that small girl, that ordinary, unassuming middle child named Grace. No one then, least of all herself, imagined what a remarkable life was in store for her, but it would prove to be amazing. Amazing Grace. Growing up on the east side of Monmouth, young Grace and her sisters Veda and Vera would walk each morning to Garfield School. As she would pass by the Monmouth College campus, considerably smaller in those days, Grace would admire the imposing dome on the new Wallace Hall and the stateliness of the auditorium and the recently completed Carnegie Library, never dreaming how familiar those buildings would become to her in future years. An outgoing girl, she enjoyed school, her friends, and outings such as church picnics. Though possessed of modest means, her parents were fun-loving and instilled in Grace a special zest for life. She remembers particularly the Chautauquas held each summer on the college campus. A large tent that would seat 3,000 was erected, and people would camp out for 12 days to hear concerts, lectures, and sermons by such luminaries as John Philip Sousa, William Jennings Bryan, and Billy Sunday. Once, when one of the speakers asked for a volunteer to sing, nine-year-old Grace promptly stood up in her chair and sang a volunteer for Jesus. As a reward, she received a New Testament, which would accompany her on travels throughout her life. That she would volunteer to sing in public at such a tender age did not surprise anyone who knew her. While her siblings seemed less than musically inclined, Grace was born with music in her soul. She began performing on the family's old pump organ, playing by ear as two of her older sisters worked the pedals, which her legs were too short to reach. She began taking piano lessons and made her first public recital at the age of 10. Throughout elementary school and later, she would travel with her teacher from school to school, performing in music classes. During high school, she kept two jobs, working in the music department of Caldwell's department store and playing piano for the silent movies downtown. Also during high school, she met a handsome young man who would later share her life and dreams, Harold A. Peterson, six years her senior, whom she affectionately called Petey. A sailor, a professional wrestler, and most important, a good dancer, he captured Grace's attention as no one else could. After graduating from high school, Grace entered the Monmouth College Conservatory of Music in 1917, where she met the second most influential person in her life, Miss Edna B. Riggs. A perfectionist and a taskmaster, Miss Riggs did her best to correct the unique style of piano playing Grace had developed largely on her own. Yet she was impressed by the natural ability of her ingenue and convinced Grace to begin teaching piano to other students. In 1921, a year before she would receive her degree, Grace started teaching at Monmouth College, a career which would span a half century. But busy as she was in the classroom, her thoughts kept straying to her handsome young wrestler. On Christmas Day, 1925, Grace and Petey were married. Petey started an appliance store in downtown Monmouth. 
Instead of settling down into marriage, however, Grace teamed with her younger sister Alice to form the Gothrop sisters. Alice's husband Roy and Petey would drive the budding artists to county fairs throughout the Midwest, and they even performed in Chicago for the founder of the Maytag Company. With the arrival of Alice's children, the duo split up, and Grace found another outlet for her energies. She directed the second UP Church Choir and instituted an annual candlelight service, which for 20 years was the highlight of the Christmas season in Monmouth. During the 40s and 50s, Grace's affinity for the stage was rekindled, and as sponsor of the College Glee Club, she produced extravaganza after extravaganza with stage shows at the Rivoli Theater. Offered twice a year, with titles such as Music Gals and Scandals, the reviews became the most sought-after ticket in town. The sets were elaborate, with stages on multiple levels, and novelties such as swings which flew out over the audience. The 1960s were the start of a new era for Gracie. Her beloved Petey died, and so did her lifelong friend and mentor, Miss Riggs. Instead of dwelling on the sadness, she made the most of the situation, and using a generous inheritance from Miss Riggs, decided to see the world. Over the next several years, she saw the world. Europe, Africa, China, Australia, Mexico, South America. Being forever a showman, Gracie transformed her travel experiences into musical travelogues and shared her experiences with thousands who could almost see the colorful stained glass of the French cathedrals as she played. In honor of her lifetime of service to Monmouth College, the college's 1970 homecoming festivities were dedicated to Gracie. The entire city of Monmouth turned out to celebrate Gracie Peterson Day. Two years later, on her 50th anniversary of teaching, she retired from the faculty, but she will never retire from her music. Four nights a week, she serenades the diners at Melling's restaurant, not for the money, but for the free meals she receives. And every Monday noon, as she has since 1922, she plays for the Monmouth Rotary Club, an organization which not only made her its first woman member, but bestowed on her its highest honor, a Paul Harris Fellowship. But beyond all the honors, it is her students who matter most to Grace. From the young ones, to whom she gave aromatic black jelly beans to tip off their parents they had been bad, to the three generations of Monmouth College students she taught, each one holds a special place in her heart. And whether they took their lessons in Austin Hall, the Fine Arts Building, or the auditorium, students remember Gracie and still visit her home when visiting Monmouth at class reunions. Oh. Well, we're going to do a, a college song for you.
you're saying, well, right. you need you to put out another red red record. I know. Uh, we yeah. need a new well, record. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. One day, when all the soldiers came in the war, we had to move down to the Fine Arts Building. Mm -hmm. And so my studio was right above the front door. And Miss Harriet Pease was there. And she would guard, she was so, and the Tom Hamiltons, they were so particular about who came in the door. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't let us come in the front door, the Hamiltons. No, we had to come in the alley. It, the front door was for company. And so Martha and Tom Hamilton, they were persnickety about that. But the students, <laughs> they would come up the drive and come in the side door and come upstairs to take their piano lessons. That's the way I came yeah. in. That's I exactly too. the way he did. Yeah. You weren't allowed to come in the front door, yeah. only guests. Yeah. And I well remember one time, uh, I was having a recital, and my two sisters, my little sisters, were in the recital, and they didn't play very well, so they went out of this recital room into my studio and jumped out the window to go home. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you want to tell about the time they stopped the train for you? Oh, Grace? yes, she I have to tell you, I was she... going to McCook, Nebraska for Floyd, and... Um, I didn't know where McCook, Nebraska was. I'm on the train. And I slept all night. And I got up early, thank goodness. I was dressed. And uh, nobody came through the train and said, McCook, Nebraska. No, nobody said a word. Finally, Floyd said to the people in McCook, We were waiting for it. We were meeting somebody it. on that train that should have gotten off. The train stopped. Then the people got off. No Gracie. No. So I went to the guy who was the conductor, I knew him, Mr. Wesh, and uh, I said, there was a woman in there, supposed to get off? Yeah, I remember her. Everybody remembers Gracie. Sure. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and he was really upset. So he went in and they radioed the train, and we drove about uh, 80 miles an hour to the next town west, and they stopped at a siding there. Cornfield. Here was the Zephyr. Here was the Zephyr. Stop out there in the middle of the country in and the we came there. up there to the side and here was Gracie coming down the middle of the railroad tracks with the conductor on each arm and she was just having a ball. Just, but the strange <laughs> part of that story was, you know, here the train stopped out in this middle of cornfield and all the passengers on the train, what in the name of God are we starting out here for? And they were so disturbed. Sabbath the day to keep it holy. In the olden days, we did that. And I will remember one time Miss Riggs and I were practicing for a two piano recital in the auditorium on the Sabbath day. Well, the pianos were backstage, and pretty soon we heard coming down the aisle, and Miss Riggs got nervous. It was Dr. McMichael coming down the aisle. He had heard us practicing. So he comes in the auditorium, and he comes down to the pianos, two pianos. He said, and girls, since when do we practice on the Sabbath day? And I didn't say a word. I let Miss Riggs do the dirty work. <laughs> but he insisted that we shut the pianos up oh. and no more rehearsal. So he stayed until we walked out of the auditorium. You could have said you were doing a concert and nobody came. No. <laughs> oh, no. We were practicing and he knew it. <laughs> I could call a really truly kind of pet. I want, I want to 
have such a lot, a jolly little doggy like you kids have got. Oh, hasn't anybody got a little yellow dog without a family? Well, quickly as you're able, buy a box and buy a label, send him through the mail to me. Hasn't anybody got a little yellow dog without a pedigree? Remember that I'm lonely, so just send the little dog. More than 75 years since she first graced its halls, Gracie is still Monmouth College's number one ambassador. In 1990, the college formally dedicated the plaza in front of its new theater in her honor. On a whirlwind trip in honor of her 90th birthday, alumni from all parts of the country flocked to greet her and renew old acquaintances. And now, in a newly decorated room near her former studio in the old Fine Arts Building, mementos of Gracie's amazing career will be housed for the enjoyment of former and future Monmouth College students.